All right, welcome back. We are game 3001. Uh, that's uh, AI for games in the winter 2022 semester. And it's week two, part one of our uh, broadcast and recording. And again, this is our lecture broadcast. We're going to do our lab, lab uh, recording and broadcast on Thursday. And it usually is the second lab that we, we kind of report. And I've done that for you last week. So let's go over the stuff that we've kind of covered from last week first, and then kind of go over the things we're going to talk about this week. So again, we're sitting at week two. Um, you know, we're talking about steering behaviors and basic, um, uh, basic movement, kinematic movement. Uh, we're going to be discussing just uh, about seek, flee, arrive, and wander. So basic movements we're going to be covering. And in our lab, again, this, this week, you're going to kind of do some more work with the um, framework, the uh, assignment framework. Uh, and that's basically what we're doing this, this week. Again, last week, uh, we kind of released assignment one, and that's due in two short weeks from now. And I've just included these two slides just to keep your, your um, you know, kind of uh, you in line with your with our schedule and to kind of look ahead a couple of weeks if you need to. Again, the full schedule is online. So last week, what we covered was an intro to AI. Uh, we talked about the difference between weak AI and strong AI um, and what game AI is. And a lot of times we talked about game AI, AI is something that is good enough. Right, so it can't be perfect a lot of times because of hardware limitations uh, and those kind of things. And what we want to try and do is, can, you know, kind of combine um, algorithms and hacks uh, to create a good enough experience for the player so that they're challenged and they keep coming back to play the game. Really, that's what we were talking about last week. We also did a tour of the assignment framework during lab. We talked about um, singletons and uh, state machine design patterns. We also discussed what I am GUI is and how to use it. And it's just a little window that we're using with another little library that allows us to kind of modify properties and values in real time. And we'll be doing more of that uh, this week during lab. Um, went into detail about version control with Git and GitHub. We also use uh, uh, GitHub Desktop. Uh, we introduced that as well as a way of, of creating private repositories. One of the tasks that you had from last week was to create a master repo or a master repository. And what you would do is you would attach every lab to it. So then, then you'd share that uh, repository with myself and Alex. Uh, some of you were successful. I saw that you sent me uh, kind of collaboration requests and Alex too, and some of you were not. Either you didn't send us a, uh, or you didn't put, you know, put our names down as collaborators, right? Or, for me personally, you use the wrong email address or the wrong account name, so I can't see your repository. So again, we'll talk about that a little bit during lab this week to correct that problem. But again, your labs usually are due Sunday, and then um, and it'll be the same for this week. This week, you'll have a lab that's due Sunday. We also talked really briefly about lab report requirements, and every lab we get together uh, to complete will include a lab report. And so that way you have, it's like a checklist that you'll go through and so on. And when you go through the checklist, uh, the, the expectation is that, hey, I did all these things or I couldn't get these things done. One of the two things. And it's kind of like an instant reflection for you as to how much you understand, uh, how much you missed and all that kind of stuff. The good thing is you can always follow along with the lab videos that I create. Um, whether you're with Alex or not, we might do things slightly differently, but for the end of, at the end of the day, they're almost, they should be almost identical, the things that we do um, in terms of um, what we're asking from you. So take a look at the lab recording, worst case scenario, um, if you can't follow along during class. Um, we expect, um, <laughs> Kristen says, I watched the video two times to get it all. I know it's a lot of detail. And the requirement is is pretty hefty for you guys because the first time that you're really using C++ in this way, um, you may have used C++ last semester just to get to know what it is, but this semester you're actually using an application, uh, you know, to create your own your own game as well and a bunch of other things. And I, I kind of gave you a warning about that when we met in Game Production 1. I said, you know what? You were using Unity for, pro for prototyping and next semester we're going to be using C++ and it's a totally different, uh, you know, playing field uh, compared to Unity. Unity is nice and simple and easy to go. 
C++ is quite complex. And, um, and believe it or not, we tried to make the R engine as simple as possible. <laughs> you believe that. Some of you probably won't. We also talked about video requirements. So video requirements are required every time you do a lab or an assignment. Uh, labs are to be done individually, like we said, and assignments are to be done in groups. And one of the things that we asked you guys to do was to, um, you know, to sign up for groups. And some of you still have not done that. If you don't sign up for a group, even if it's a group of one, right, you will not be able to complete your assignments. So please sign up for groups today. I highly recommend um, you at least sign up with a partner, a lab partner. It'll make your, you know, or assignment partner. It'll make your, uh, your life a lot easier because you can do peer programming. Uh, where you sit next to each other uh, virtually and basically talk about what you're doing and then go, kind of go through the code and try and get a better effect uh, closer to what we're looking for than if you're trying to do it on your own. And then there's a lot of learning there to be done if you're working with one other person. If you're working with another two people, then the great thing is you can make it look even nicer and feel nicer. So that's why we've given you the option to work with, with group sizes of two to three uh, as an example. All right, and so I think that uh, you know there's there's opportunity still for you guys to do that. So what are we doing this week? We're going to be talking about again autonomous character movement. And again, when I think when you when we talk about autonomous agents or autonomous characters, we can think of uh, AI agents as what autonomous characters are. That's what we when we think about that. We're going to be talking about kinematics and uh, what that is, the science of motion, if you will. And we're also going to do a, a brief intro to steering behaviors this week and talk about what the difference is between kinematic movement and dynamic movement. So that's kind of what we're doing. Lab two is going to be due Sunday at midnight, um, similar to what we did last week. And assignment one is still on our radar. And that is due week four. Again, please, if you haven't had a chance to sign up again, I'm reminding you one more time, uh, sign up uh, for a group with a partner. If you don't, you will not be able to see your assignment. I still see there are plenty of people that have yet to sign up for a group. Um, and what that does is it makes the assignment unavailable for you. All right. So and and then you'll be like, well, I can't see this, the assignment submission. Well, you wouldn't be able to see the assignment submission until you actually sign up for a group. Is there like a formal sign up thing we fill out? Well, you go to groups. So the way where you go is you go to tools on Blackboard and then you go to groups. And then there you'll see a sign up sheet that is for your uh, assignment one uh, groups. OK, take a look at that. So you go to tools, groups on Blackboard. Do that now and you'll see what that looks like. All right. So that is uh, kind of what we're doing this week. Let's talk about a little bit about movement in the using the AI model that we talked about last week. So Again, it's a critical part of AI and games, like we talked about before. Um, it hasn't changed a lot, and uh, we're going to talk about some basic movement. And some of you have tried to start basic movement going because of uh, game production too, and it's good. We're going to hopefully help you with that uh, in the coming weeks. All right. So again, when we think about movement algorithms, um, you know these movement algorithms don't really require any decision making. It's like almost like moving an object or an autonomous character AI agent from one place to another place. And the idea with this is, um, you know, it's like we move it, we move the autonomous character to a location after a decision is made, or I've detected the player using line of sight or some other sensing mechanism. And the idea for us is, um, we're really thinking about the resultant movement uh, of our, our autonomous characters rather than their individual animations. We don't really care about that when we come when we think about um, you know uh, AI programming. We're thinking about you know movement. And let me ask you this question, guys: Does anyone know the difference? Can you tell me the difference between locomotion and animation? All right. So, does anyone know the difference between those two things? And you know, I don't want you to look it up. I want you to intuit a little bit. So what's the difference in locomotion and animation? Yes? You can put it in the chat if you like. 
So, and the reason why I'm asking this question, because it's key, right? People get, you know, kind of mixed up with what it is. Uh, so Aiden says, well, they car, call, a, call a car a locomotive. Yeah. Okay. So what does that mean? Uh, Raul says locomotion is dynamic. Christian says locomotion is animation synced with motion. Keep going. Anyone else? Excellent. Lisbeth actually has kind of the closest to the right answer, which is locomotion is the actual movement and animation is just what the player sees. And that's pretty good. I like to think about animation as what's happening to the game object. So it's almost like I have a container for the game object itself. I might have one or more sub objects inside of the game object uh, container and whatever's happening inside of the game object, which is parented to the, you know, the container itself right? That's the animation. It could be something that's moving within the game object itself, right? We have movement, you know, as an example, but we may not have any locomotion. Locomotion is also, in my mind, another word for displacement. I want to displace an object from position A to position B, right? So when I'm moving an object from A to B, there's locomotion that's taking place, or we can also call it displacement, right? So I'm moving it from A to B. Um, and displacement has other connotations that we're going to we're going to learn about in physics um, because it's a key, you know, kind of understanding when it comes to what is velocity. When we talk about what the difference between velocity is and what speed, speed and velocity are different things. And so we'll talk about those things as well. So when we think about this, we start off with uh, an autonomous character's current position. And we start thinking about other physical attributes as well to control its movement, velocity, maneuverability, mass, um, you know, you know, turn rate, uh, turn speed, you know, those kind of things. Uh, turn radius is also something that we can we can figure out depending on the size of you know the object's body and so on. And when we think about a movement algorithm, we use properties to kind of figure out character uh, movement and where it should go next. And basically. All algorithms start off with uh, the character state and the current state of the world and generate an output on how the character is going to move. That's pretty much on, at a high level how they work. So when we think about it, it's um, something like this. So here's my character position as an example. And then we plug our character position into our movement algorithm, right? As an example, we also plug in other uh, game uh, factors, for example, things like gravity other characters, the level geometry, and all that kind of stuff. And then what it does is it outputs a velocity. All right, that's what happens. And it kind of, it's cyclical. So it kind of feeds back into the character's current position because the current position has changed based on, um, you know, factors. So in other words, if I have, if, if I'm moving across um, some kind of geometry, you know, example, up a hill, you know, I might be moving a little bit slower because of gravity or whatever. Um, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And forces, if I have new velocity or forces to apply, that kind of ties into, um, you know, the output from my movement algorithm that can, kind of feeds back into the character. So when it comes to this, you know, again, um, algorithms don't need a lot of, movement algorithms don't need a lot of input. Uh, we, d we just need the position of the character and let's suppose the enemy to chase. And the enemy usually is you. When we say position of the character, we're talking about the autonomous character. Um, one other thing we have to think about is this. Sometimes we also want to calculate or uh, want to keep in mind for the autonomous character um, other factors, things like, hey, are we going to do obstacle avoidance? It's going to, is it going to go uh, along a particular path? Um, you know, it can, is there a different um, a walking speed based on the, on the terrain? You know, difficult terrain versus normal terrain versus unwalkable terrain, those kind of things. And that'll change our, the ability for us to navigate across the game world and to, to seek the player typically a lot, uh, you know, many times. So let's talk about the difference between kinematic movement and dynamic movement. So when we think about and we talk about kinematic movement, which is really the topic of this week, right, we want to think about, um, you know, the motion because kinematics right, uh, means mo kinematic is motion. So when I think about motion, right, energy that's, you know, that's related to motion, so kinematic uh, forces and those kind of things. When we think about that, and we talk about kinematics in games, 
those kinds of movements don't require or use acceleration and deceleration. It's like they have a constant rate of speed. Okay, and um, so really what we only think about is just a direction. We want to know where we're going. We know that the speed is what the speed is going to be. It's going to be the max speed. Whatever the max speed is, that's how we're going to move. And a lot of times that's okay, right? A good example of that is bullets, right? We don't need to accelerate a bullet typically, you know, to get somewhere, right? Bullets are going to probably be seen, if we're going to see them at all, at a constant rate of speed, okay? So that's kinematic movement. Um, if I have uh, seeking missiles, all right, and that kind of stuff, and, um, you know, we could use them as dynamic. So you could like start them off really slow and then accelerate them and also change the direction that they're, that they're facing as they're moving and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, even missiles, if you actually have some kind of missile that you're seeing in the actual game world, um, we can also picture it as, you know, kinematic. So it's going to be just moving at the same rate of speed. There's no acceleration or deceleration. Dynamic movement, on the other hand, um, you know, it's it's totally different. It takes into account whatever the current motion of the character is. And then what we want to do is we look at the velocity. And we'll talk about velocity in a second. Um, and, and we kind of, a lot of times we either accelerate or decelerate an object. And it looks a lot smoother to us than kinematic motion. Kinematic motion is abrupt kinematic motion is basic if i want to move from a to b um and i don't care about smoothing at all um and we can and we're going to talk about smoothing algorithms today but typically what it is is i want to move and i don't want i don't care about acceleration or deceleration that's kinematic dynamic is different dynamic is going to respond it's going to be adding in a bit of physics for us in order for us to kind of move more realistically and so, because it's more realistic, it's also more computationally expensive to use dynamic movement versus uh, kinematic movement because you're going to tie in additional lines of code to make it look more realistic. And we'll talk about how to do that. And mostly, most of this uh, dynamic motion we'll be talking about next week. So let's think about, uh, when we first think about movement, we want to think about our 2D space, right? And again, uh, in this course, we're primarily working with uh, motion in 2D, but a lot of the stuff we talked about in 2D in this course can also apply to a three-dimensional world. Okay, so we just to extrapolate um, our algorithms so that they work in three dimensions as opposed to two dimensions. A lot of times when we look at two-dimensional coordinates, we usually use X and Y or Z. It really depends on the, on the coordinate system that you're using. In our case, our assignment framework is using the X and Y coordinate space because we're using SDL as our um, API, right? Or application programming interface. Um, a lot of times we don't just have X and Y for where it's gonna be or X and Z, depending on how you look at it, right? But we also have something else. We have something called an orientation value or facing, all right? That's kind of important. And, um, a lot of times the orientation value or facing of an object uh, or direction, if you will, um, is uh, an angle, you know, relative to a reference axis. So, for example, now a re an angle relative to the Y axis or an angle relative to the X axis. OK, that's typically how we do our orientation value. And when we think about our axes and orientation, here's an example of that. A lot of times, by the way. Uh, we use radians, and we want to convert our degrees. Humans, they have a lot of difficulty using radians in the real world, um, for the average person anyway. And so we want to convert uh, degrees to radians. This is a um, something that we always do when we want to use uh, angles, because when we use angles, we plug uh, the angle in degrees into a uh, some kind of trigonometric function. Uh, cosine or sine is a good example of that. And um, we want to convert it, of course, into radians, or we're going to get the wrong values. And the way to do that is one rad or radian is equal to the number of degrees times pi over 180 degrees. Okay, so that's how, how we do it. And then when we get that motion, sometimes we want to display something or calculate something in degrees on the way back out. And the way we can do that, is, of course, is just do it the other way around. We can convert radians to degrees. Our util uh, function uh, or util class that's found in your assignment framework has a deg to rad uh, and rad to deg uh, constant that you can multiply 
uh, by either degrees or radians to convert. And we'll talk about that in lab at some point this semester. But the idea is radians is, uh, is the language, the, the notation for computers, and degrees is something that we understand. A lot of times what we'll be doing is we're using some kind of struct or class, some kind of structure that we're going to use to keep track of our player. In this case, we have position and orientation. And last week when we talked in our lab, we showed you a couple things in terms of our, of our game object, right? Remember, we talked that the game object, all game objects have a transform uh, similar to what we, we learned in Unity. And the transform has uh, position, rotation, and scale. And uh, one of the things that the character doesn't have by default, the autonomous characters we've given you, is an orientation value, which is a, um, a value, a rotation, you know, where they're looking. So what's the current orientation? Are they looking to the right, to the top, and left, and so on? And in computers, depending on uh, your uh, framework, um, we kind of use the compass rows a lot of times to kind of figure out where we start. And a lot of times, the zero mark right? The zero angle is pointing towards the east. So again, if I was going to draw something here for us, let's just use our little drawing tool again, like uh, as if we're on a whiteboard, then let's suppose we have, you know, kind of all the angles. And what we want to think about is that the orientation, when we start off at zero from the middle, uh, kind of points to the east. So that is your zero point a lot of times, right? And if that's true, if our uh, zero angle starts over here, right, when we're rotating, and a lot of times rotation is important. Um, if I rotate upwards, right, because again, remember up is negative and down is positive, right, because when we start thinking about drawing in a 2D coordinate system, you know, like SDL, like we talked about before, if this is your screen, Remember, as a review, that the top left corner of the screen is where zero zero is. That's the you know your kind of the the origin of your game world uh, in SDL. That's kind of how it works, right? And what we do is what we draw, and you've learned this in game fundamentals as well. We draw kind of marching toward the right, and as we march toward the right, we increase values of x, and then we kind of go down one, and then keep on drawing across our screen. So we kind of draw from the top left corner of the screen to the bottom right corner of the screen. So Positive x values march to the right and positive y values march down. If I want to go up, I have to go negative y. And so the same thing goes with a rotation. If I want to rotate so that I'm facing north, right? And again, I'm facing north means, again, I'm, I'm just facing upwards in the upwards direction, right? So this would be the north, uh, you know, kind of facing, if you will. And this would be east, like we mentioned before, right? Then I'm going to rotate. 90 degrees to the left. And anything that's left typically is negative 90. So typically what I would do is kind of march negative 90 degrees, you know, again, to the left when it comes to rotations. Again, you'll see that this is slightly modified when we're actually in game because uh, we've made some adjustments to adjust for this negative 90 kind of thing. So again, that's the rotation. We march kind of rotate to the left you know, we keep rotating to the left, it's 180, rotate to the left, it's 270, rotate to the left again, and we're back at um, at zero or 360, which is kind of tied in together. So these kind of rotations that we're doing, and a lot of times these rotations in two-dimensional space, they're called Euler rotations, right? Euler rotations. And um, if it looks like Euler, it's not Euler, it's Euler, uh, you can look it up. But basically, that is a good thing. It's okay with x and x and y coordinates on a two-dimensional plane. Not so good with three-dimensional rotations because you get into something called gimbal lock, right? And to avoid gimbal lock in three-dimensional rotations, which we're going to be talking about when you hit when you start learning about three-dimensional graphics or using OpenGL um, or other frameworks we're going to be using something called quaternions, okay? So quaternion or qu uh, a quaternion or quaternion rotations are what we want to do to avoid gimbal lock, right? For now, we don't care about this stuff. It's not really important to us. Um, so for what we're doing this semester, we can not think about gimbal lock. We don't care about this stuff and we don't care about quaternions. We're going to be using Euler rotations 
um, across the z-axis. So the z-axis being going into the screen itself. So we're rotating around the z-axis. We don't care about rotating across the x-axis and the y-axis when it comes to rotation. So why am I talking about rotations? Because we're going to need to know direction. And uh, there's ways of getting to direction, and we'll talk about that in a second. So position is one thing. Orientation is a single floating point value, which is the angle that we're looking at, right, as an example. So when it comes to vector orientation uh, using a vector, um, when we say a vector is a, um, a unit vector, we mean that it has a length of one. And a length of one means that the magnitude of the vector is one, okay? A magnitude is one. That means the distance from the origin, as an example, will be a total length of one unit, okay? And um, there's a couple ways to determine the direction of an object, right? One of the ways is if I take my target, whatever my target object is, and I subtract my origin, right? So whatever uh, the start, let's say start, let's say the target is at the end, and I subtract the start, right? And if these two things are vectors, right? X and Y coordinates, right? That's what they would be. So let's suppose they are vectors, right? The end vector and the start vector, both, uh, you know, coordinate frames. What we're going to get if I do that, the end minus start is a line that draws between my, my end and my start. So let's, let's try this out. So let's suppose that um, we have our starting point somewhere on the screen, right? Here's our starting point, let's suppose. And let's suppose that we also have an endpoint and we want to calculate the direction of our, uh, from start to end, right? So we're going to draw a line. Typically, if we do end minus start, the resulting vector is going to be a line that goes from here. Let's try that again. That goes from here to there, oops. And now, of course, we don't draw lines. Woo, I love it. Uh, from here to there. That's what we want to do, right? That's the line. And we don't care about this line. This line is meaningless to us. We don't want to draw a line. We want to just get almost like a little arrow, right? So the, the unit vector, what we want to do is normalize this line, right? We want to normalize this line and only get um, a value that is pointing, a vector that is pointing uh, from start to end with a, a total magnitude, instead of this being the total magnitude from start to end, the distance between start and end, that's what magnitude also is in many ways, right? Um, instead of the, we having the total distance, we don't care about the total distance. All we care about is the direction. And in order for us to do that, we take the total distance uh, or the, the vector and divide it, each uh, component, the X and the Y, by the total distance. Okay, so let's do some calculations to, to see what I'm talking about here. Let's put some values in here. All right, so you understand what I'm saying. So let's suppose our start, because it's way down here, if we march, uh, let's suppose the screen is 800 by 600. So this is 800 wide, you know, as an example, just kind of like our, our screen is, 800 width. And let's suppose our, our height is 600 pixels, right? And if we're going to try and calculate uh, just roughly between start and end, right? And let's suppose this is the middle point. So it's like 400 and then we're seeing, sending a 200. We're almost, let's say, about 150. So let's say our X value would be 150. And then if this was uh, 300 and this would be maybe about 450. So 150 and 450 is a pretty good value, right? So that would be 150 and 450. In terms of pixels, this is the number of pixels where the starting location is. Okay, let's we put some values here for, for you guys, right? So what is the end point? Well, we can try and use the same logic. So this is 400, maybe this is 600 uh, from an X perspective and Y, if this was, you know, three, this would be 150. So something like 600 and 150, okay? So 600 and 150, okay? We want to find the distance from our start to the end first. So if I subtract, first of all, if I subtract these two vectors, I do component subtraction. So if I subtract end minus start, like I said, we do something that looks like this, right? Our end x minus our starting x, right? And then we take our end y minus our starting y, right? And then we have a value. That's the first thing we do. We start calculating these two things, okay? 
So we get a resultant vector that looks like what? Well, 600 minus 150 is, let's say, 450. And then what is 150 minus 450? That's negative or minus 300, right? Would you agree? So that 450 minus 300 is the total vector from here to here, 450 minus 300. And we have a magnitude. There's a distance, right? Um, we can also figure out between the start and the end point. And remember the distance calculations that we'll be using. We're using Pythagorean distance. And what is that, right? It's the square root, right, of the um, uh, x2 minus x1 squared, right, plus y2 minus y1 squared, right? That's kind of the, the distance formula that we use. That's Pythagorean distance, very bad to use for every frame because it's computationally expensive because of the square root value. Square root is bad to use. A lot of times we want to use squared magnitude like we talked about. So if I plug these values in here and do a quick calculation, what is the distance between, um, you know, let's say 150 and, uh, or 150, 450 and 600, 150? What is the total distance here? And can someone help me out calculate this? Let's see if we get some values from the people that are watching. Anyone? And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second when it comes to this, right? Lucas says they'll try. Let's see. So again, if we plug in those values, let's see. First of all, what we want to do is we can break this formula down into uh, what we already did, right? Which is we kind of did this calculation, right? So 600 minus 150, x2 minus x1, we kind of did that there. So we can plug that value in. That's 450. Take a look, right? So that value there is 450, right, squared. And this value here is y2 minus y1 is negative 300, right? So the values are relative, you know, relevant, sorry, for, for what we're doing. There's negative 300. If we square uh, 450, that's like saying 450 times 450. So let's, let's see how that is. So if I bring up my calculator, 450 times 450. By the way, we, would want, we don't want to use a square function here either, like a power function. That's like double square root uh, in terms of uh, bad uh, for per computation. So we can take this value here, right? This value, 202,500, let's take that. So 202 as an intermediary value, 202,500 is the value that we're gonna use when we square it, all right? And um, we also want to square minus 300. When we square a negative number, the negative sign goes away and that's good because we can't have a negative value under the square root because that is undefined. Uh, this is just math revision, you know, revised. We just can consider this as 300. 300 times 300, right? We can just do that. We can figure that out pretty simply. Okay, that's 90,000, and we put that in there. So let's put that 90,000 inside of there, right? Okay, so that's what that ends up being. Again, we're, we're working within the square root right now, right? And we add those two things together because we have that plus sign, right? That we add those two things together underneath the square root. And so let's add those two values. You know, that's the first thing we would do. Order of operations and all that. First, we deal with the exponents and, um, and the stuff. First, it's brackets, then exponents, then addition and subtraction, multiplication, and so on. Right? Multiplication, division first, obviously. But we don't have anything in, inside here, multiplication, division. So we take that value, 202,500, as an example, and plus 90,000. And then we come up with a value that's 292,500, right? So let's, uh, you know, let's put that in there. So 292, 500, which is pretty straightforward, right? That's the combined value. And then we take the square root. I'm kind of go through, going through this step by step with you guys so that you see it. And here's the square root, one over X, right? And um, is that really what it is or is it this one? It's this one, right? And we come up with a value of 540 pixels, right? 540.83, which is roughly 541 because there isn't a 0.83 pixel. So let's just use 541, all right, as a, as a value that we rounded up. So 541. So that is the distance between those two values, right? We found the distance between that's 541 pixels, right? That's what it is, pixels. Do you agree? Did I miscalculate? Oh, 
Nestor sends is the same. So he's kind of in line with what I'm doing. So 541 pixels from here to here. Okay, but we don't care about the distance. We care about, um, we what we care about is uh, a normalized value that points at the endpoint, okay? We have this, that's the total vector. And so what we wanna do to get a normalized value or the unit vector is divide these two values by the total distance. So that what we do is, for the first one, we take uh, 450 as an example. And we're gonna use the, the values we have here, not the values in the calculator, divided by uh, 541. And that's gonna work out to 0.83. We need to keep this 0.83 uh, roughly, right? So 0.83, we're gonna put that in as the first part of our equation, 0 0.83. And then the second part is minus 300 over 541, right? So again, where's that calc? Uh, you know, minus 300, so 300. And we wanna uh, flip the sign. Um, where is memory? Oh, there it is. Uh, you know, divided by 541, and it comes up with a negative 55.45, which is, let's say, negative 0 0.55. 0 0.55. That, my friends, is the unit vector. Okay, with a total size of one. Okay, so that's the unit vector. And also, when we think about what that is, that is the direction, right? Of where what uh, the from um, that's the direction vector from the start to the end. We don't care about the actual value, the length of 541 pixels. We just want a length of one, and that's what the direction is. We multiply divided by uh, the distance, right? Each component x and y. We divide it by the distance to get the unit vector. Clear. And once we have the, the, the direction, I can multiply the direction and I can get the next pixel, the next pixel, the next pixel, the next pixel, every single time, right? I don't have to use trig to do this. I can literally just, you know, use the direction vector as something that's the next, I can multiply this by a scalar like speed and I can kind of march along this number line or this, this, uh, this uh, line segment, okay, which is pretty cool. So that is what we we're talking about when we're talking about unit vector. Okay, questions around this process that I used. Um, Cody says, so one heavy one to start with and a bunch of quick ones after. Yeah, I guess. Um, but again, what we don't want to do is this is just, a, a you know, when we use square root, there's other ways to do it. How do I avoid using square root altogether? I keep these values. So I keep 292, 2500, right, as an example. And um, that is the distance and uh, like a squared distance because it's like saying 541 times 541. I take the squared distance. Um, and then in terms of these, I just square these. So 450 times 450, right? So it's a ratio. It's 202500 divided by 292500. And then there's no square root required. It's going to give you the same answers. Negative 300 times negative 300 is 90,000. 90,000 divided by 292500 is Again, so negative 0 0.55, you can avoid using square root. And so your calculation is going to be without using square root, and that's what we want to avoid. Okay, so that's kind of uh, where we're going. If the math is weird for you, as an example, don't worry about it. Um, you're gonna get used to it. We're gonna see it more often as we go forward. One thing to notice is here, we can also use sine and cosine, right? The unit vector, which is a length of one, is what we've just calculated. And notice we can use the sine of the angle, uh, you know, over the cos of the angle. A lot of times also what you're going to notice, guys, is that sine is related to y. If I want to find the next component on the y-axis, the next uh, pixel on the y-axis, usually we use sine multiplied by the angle. Uh, and then for x-axis, we use the, um, we use cosine. So if I want to find the next uh, X component or X location for a pixel, it's usually related to cosine. So X cos theta as an example, and then uh, sine, uh, you know, or X sine theta, or if I want to say instead of X, we can use velocity. Let's say we want to use, we have a velocity or speed, and I want to find the next location for X, for my X and Y coordinates. I take the velocity multiplied by sine theta, theta being the angle where I'm going, and, or the orientation, and uh, velocity cos theta, 
and then I know the x and y coordinates, another way of getting it. But we need to use uh, trigonometric functions for that. So again, look, take a look. That would be uh, exactly what we're talking about. If I want to change direction, my orientation, as an example, I get a vector. And a lot of times vectors are written with square brackets like this too, where we have x over y, like this. All right, that's kind of how it looks. So 0.997 radians over 0 .00, uh, 0.071 radians, whatever that is. Okay, uh, Raul says, how would I get the angle from the unit vector? So then you'd go back the other way around. Once I have the, the result, I can do an arc, uh, you know, I can use arc 10, uh, 2, actually a tan 2, to get the, the, the angle back. So a tan 2 is I plug in the values in the other way around. I already have my the destination, I already have my vector, and I can use a tan 2 by plugging in, uh, you know, x and y values, and to get back the, uh, the, the, um, the angle in degrees. We'll talk about that soon. All right, so kinematics. We can create movement algorithms to calculate the target velocity based on position or orientation, like we said, and this will allow us the output velocity to change instantly. Again, remember in kinematics, we don't do acceleration uh, or deceleration. Uh, but again, velocities in the real world don't do that. So we can use some kind of smoothing algorithm. And, and what that can do is it can change things slightly each frame. And let's do, do a quick case study on smoothing algorithms. One of them that we're going to learn about uh, this semester, and you probably already know about maybe from Game Fundamentals, is something called a LERP or a linear interpolation. And um, really think about this. If I was to move from A to B instantly, Right, because that's what will happen if you in on your screen if you don't slow things down. Right, it'll look like you're flashing from A to B. Right, so we want to move every frame, some amount every frame, and you want to scale it, uh, your movement a little bit. And so what we want to do is we want to add movement across additional frames, or we want to call it is uh, something like in betweening when it comes to uh, animation. So the mathematical formula for LERP is, LERP is equal to A, you pass in three parameters, A, B, and T, where A is the starting location, B is the final location, and T is some kind of percentage between the starting location and the final location, right? And uh, what you wanna do is you can make your own LERP formula. By the way, I have LERP formulas that we've added for you in the util uh, you know, class uh, in our assignment framework. Uh, so you can plug in, you know, the vector A, vector B, and then some kind of value. And this value will be the how the percentage of the distance from 0 to 1, where 1 is 100% and 0 is 0% 0 from A to B. So if I plug in a value of 0.5, it'll be the midpoint between A and B. Lerping values are really great because they can, if you calculate the lerping value every frame, let's say, for example, you say, I want to go uh, 0.1, so you put a value of t as 0.1 of the distance every frame from a to b and then you update a every single time right so example i'm moving from a to b right and the the 10 percent of the value between a and b is whatever that you know next pixel is going to be that you're going to calculate based on your velocity right as an example and then you plug that back into a okay i want to move from this a to, to b i want to move 10 percent of the value from a to b you'll get a smoothing function and it'll make it look very nice to move from A to B and vice versa. If you want to move from B back to A, uh, you would switch these values around. Okay. The value of T can vary. It can be from, you can make it so it's only 0.1 or you can go to 0.9, where this is like, let's say 90% of the, of, of the motion from A to B in one frame. Um, and we can try some of these values out in class. So that's linear interpolation. And you should, if you've never heard about linear interpolation before, then we're going to be using it uh, kind of throughout this course and the next one. There's the thing to look at a lot of times for us from an understanding perspective. You're going to see that, especially in physics, is something called motion graphs, right? And we're going to see motion graphs again uh, this semester as well as next semester. And when we think about motion graphs, it's kind of a visual, um, you know, kind of uh, description about motion. When I look at a motion, I can visualize, uh, you know, the motion. Some key terms to note is motion. What is that? It's a change in position measured by distance and time. And speed tells us the rate at which an object is moving. So distance over time is what speed is. Velocity is displacement over time. And it also, because velocity is also a vector, uh, velocity and acceleration are vectors. Speed is usually a scalar. 
Um, and uh, velocity tells us not just uh, the speed, but also where we're going, right? So speed and direction, or a lot of times vectors can be described as having magnitude and direction. Magnitude is just another word for speed here in our case for velocity. And the next one is acceleration. What is acceleration? Acceleration is related to velocity, and that's it's the rate of change in velocity over time. So how fast does velocity change? Is it increasing or decreasing? If the velocity is not increasing or decreasing, we can say that the acceleration is zero. Okay, so that's what we're, we're talking about. So again, key terms. This might be a review from you if you've taken physics uh, from high school, as an example, or if you've done any, of, any kind of physics work on your own. So when we look at a motion graph then, and that's a good way of thinking about motion, we look at y as the distance uh, and x as time. So again, what we want to do is distance over time. Remember, it's usually y over x or, you know, use some kind of value like this. And so when we think about this line here, this is uh, the motion is linear, where uh, the amount of distance that we march every frame is um, proportional or linear to time. So time and distance is the same. If this had a some kind of curve to it, right, as an example, and if it wasn't like this, then it would be more of a smooth motion. Why? Because it would, you know, this is, there's no acceleration here. The velocity, distance over time, or the speed is the same. Speed is not changing here. But if we had a curve, and we're, we'll talk about that later on, we have a curve here in, in, the, uh, in the graph, whether it's this way or this way, then the motion would be different. Okay, so example, um, so if I was going to draw, you know, let's just see if we can do this with, uh, with uh, tools in, um, uh, here in, in, uh, in PowerPoint, uh, it's not going to work for me. I guess I'm just going to have to use an annotation uh, just moments while I do that. And let's suppose that I want to draw a, I'm going to draw it with my pen. So, yeah, you know, uh, be, 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 be nice, be kind, guys. So imagine if I'm drawing and the curve looks like this. What kind of curve is this compared to this one? What does this tell you if, if the curve is this way? So if you look at this curve and it's this is time and this is distance, what does it mean? How, what, what motion does this describe? Think about it. It's accelerating, right? Because we're starting off, the distance is very slowly accelerating. And as we go, you know, kind of we're moving upwards and you see the distance is increasing a lot as as time increases so it's like really accelerating right and what about if the motion was this way so we kind of move this way and then we kind of did this way right think about the other way what's that if i did this if i just did it this way decelerating right because we've got a lot of distance not too much time so it's moving quite quick actually uh, or the, the 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 distance is changing very quickly and then it's slowing down the dis the displacement every frame every time time step is slowing down, slowing down until there's more time and less distance. If it's more time and less distance, it's slowing down. If it's more distance, um, you know, and less time, that's speeding up, you know, kind of thing. Or yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of the the way it would look. So motion graphs are awesome, you know. That uh, look at what about what about if you see something that looks like this, uh, a graph that looks like that? What does that mean? If I have a graph this way. Right, so I have distance, and think about this as the origin. So here's the origin. I have distance, and then I have this. What does this tell you? Backward, right, because I'm going somewhere else, and then I'm moving back towards the origin, right, over time until I'm at the origin, right? And that's interesting that you guys that you guys can figure that out. That's great. And again, it's the same thing um, if I did it the other way around, right? So if I want to go forward, right? So lots of really great ways of using distance time graphs or motion graphs to, to kind of describe distance. And once we start thinking about things in this way, right, when we use graphs, and you can use all kinds of, of funky things going on here, where I can accelerate, decelerate at the same time, you can create a smoothing algorithm, right, to see how this works. And we'll talk about this uh, in more detail as we go forward in the course. I just wanna talk about motion graphs just really briefly today, just to, and we'll, we'll kind of revisit motion graphs later. All right, so that is motion graphs, and we also talked about smoothing algorithms, and the one that we want to use is linear interpolation or lerping. All right, so then when we know that, um, autonomous you know, characters need to keep track of their linear and angular velocities. And again, 
Um, we want X and Y or X and Z components as an example. And going forward, when, I, when we think about linear velocity, let's just refer to it as velocity because that's really what it's going to be, right? And when we think about velocity, it's velocity is the displacement. That's what S is over time, displacement over time. And that's linear velocity. And usually it's a vector quantity, okay? Whereas angular velocity, right, is how fast an autonomous character's orientation or rotation is changing over time. So again, if you notice the number, the angle, uh, you know, the change in angle over time is going to give you your angular velocity or omega, right? That's what it is. Okay, so angular velocity is rotation over time. We can call this just rotation. All right. So when it comes to kinematics and we think about the kinematic formulas and some information about our, our um, and whether we call it a kinematic or a transform in our case, we have position, orientation, velocity, and rotation. Um, definitely rotation is there. And what I've done for you guys in our assignment framework is we've removed velocity and put that inside something called a rigid body that we're going to be using later on. All right, one thing to note is that velocity and orientation have nothing to do with each other, right? I can have an object having a velocity and I can be looking somewhere else, right? So, um, you know, when I think about moving and facing, those two things have nothing to do with each other. They're independent variables, if you will, right? So that's something to know uh, and to note about it. So again, a lot of steering behaviors we have just totally ignore facing. We don't care facing of an object. We just care about the motion of the object, right? And so um, we can think that, um, you know, both velocity and orientation, uh, having both at the same time is nice to have, but a lot of times we only care about the velocity. So orientation should be updated so that it matches the direction of motion. That would be very nice. It will look much smoother and much nicer. And um, we can set the orientation to the direction of motion, but then the orientation changes too, too much if we did that right away. If I say, well, I want to move in the direction, all of a sudden I'm snapping to that direction. And that's like not really great. So the way to do that, of course, is to use some kind of linear interpolation. And we can use lerping not just for lines, but we can do a lerp a special type of lerp uh, for um, a, you know angular change, which is what what an angular lerp called. It's a special name for that. Let's see if you guys know it from physics, right? Anybody? Okay, it's called a slurp, <laughs> right? Uh, believe it or not, there's a, a lerp and a slurp, and usually a slurp uh, is a curve. So we're we're changing our our, um, you know, kind of a rotation over time. I know this is great words. Uh, and a slurp, we're slurping from one kind of orientation to another. And usually it's using some kind of graph to do that, right? But basically think about this from frame one to frame two, we rotate slightly from frame two to frame three, we rotate a little bit more. And then finally to frame four, and this will look a lot better. Usually there's more frames involved than just four. All right. Um, what about if um, our game has a physics simulation layer, and in our case we don't, then we can use it to update the position and orientation of autonomous characters. We're going to be discussing, and some people have asked us already, um, how to do that, and we're going to build our own physics engine in another course, usually in the next course that you're going to do, uh, which is coming up in um, the summer for some of you, and for some of you you're going to hit it in the fall, depending on your scheduling. Okay. So we have physics 2D coming up in summer and, um, and some people will take in the fall, but I think it's great. You'll learn about uh, physics equations for motion and all that stuff. We'll also kind of touch upon them or do an intro uh, to some of those kinematic equations here in our AI course because we need them for movement. Okay, so again, we can use basic physics equations for those things. So I've just given you an example of a kinematic struct. We're not gonna do a lot of these but here's an example of what you might need. So, um, you know, we, Jack uh, had asked earlier, hey, I wanted to do a jumping motion. Uh, what could I do? And really think about what this is. You take your position and you update it with your velocity and multiply it by time. This is kind of the classic physics equation, right? And uh, you plus you add in half of your, of your uh, acceleration multiplied by time uh, twice, right? But a lot of times when we do these kinds of equations, 
as an example, whether it's velocity or rotation, here's your angular uh, steering, your angular velocity and your linear velocity, that's what those two things are, in this particular uh, pseudocode here, then um, we don't really care about that because the values are so small and we're using frames instead of time that we can literally just boil it down to velocity times delta time. Uh, a lot of times we use delta time as something that we have in here. All right. So that's something we can do. All right, any questions around this? And I, I wanna talk about this really quickly because think about this, what they're doing is they're changing the position. So velocity over time, right? And the orientation, which is rotation over time. So we're moving the orientation or the rotation of the object in two dimensional space over time. And usually time re means delta time. Um, and then what we do is once we have the position and orientation values, then what we want to do is is update the position and orientation values, uh, you know, relative to the, um, you know, the uh, linear velocity and the angular velocity we can move. So steering, linear and steering angular is how much we can rotate over time, but the, cap the capacity to rotate. Again, this is just a piece of pseudocode that we can, we can work on uh, in our... Um, in our classes that'll be slightly different than this. All right, so when it comes to movement, a lot of times, and we wanna do something with acceleration at all, we want to apply something called forces. And we're gonna learn about forces again in the next course. But one thing is there are three laws of motion that we're gonna follow in, um, in physics. The first law states that for every, for objects at rest tend to stay at rest and objects at motion tend to stay in motion. We're gonna learn about that, right? So we want to push an object or stop an object, a lot of times uh, we're going to use Newton's first law. If I want to accelerate an object, I need to use a, amount of, a certain amount of force based on an object's mass. And usually that's Newton's second law, which is force. Uh, the amount of force we need is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration value. All right, so that's the amount of force. And so if I want to achieve a certain acceleration, I can calculate the force that I need, right? Um, so that's one thing. And of course, Newton's third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? So that uh, talks about things like collision detection and response, which we're going to learn about in, again, in physics. So really, acceleration depends on the inertia or mass of an object. The more massive an object is, it takes more inertia, the more energy, if you will, uh, to move it. That's what it uh, takes. So if an object's at rest, like Newton's first law, and I want to push it, it's going to take a lot more energy than if, it, if, if it's really, really heavy compared to if it's super light. Okay, that's what that really means. So that's what forces are all about. Um, and for us, we're going to use uh, this a little bit this semester, but not much. And the reason for this is because we have a whole course kind of talk about how to use forces to create realistic movements and motion uh, using something like physics, our own homegrown physics. All right, so then what we want to use is uh, kind of kinematic movement algorithms. And a lot of times what we do is we start and stop uh, motions immediately. We don't use acceleration. However, we can use linear interpolation or lerping to kind of smooth out our motion, almost like an ease in and an ease out motion. Um, and using eases, like an ease in or an ease out or a smooth step, as long as uh, it's also called that, um, then using a smooth step algorithm, um, what it does for us is it creates nicer looking motion as opposed to uh, abrupt, you know, we're moving at 100% speed or zero. You know, that's kind of stuff, which is what kinematic motion is known for mostly. And um, again, there's that uh, arctan2 or atan2 uh, arctangent. And um, this is going to give you the, uh, the angle uh, that we're going to get out. So if we want to get the orientation angle, that's what this get or new orientation function does. And it returns, I take my X value and my Y value. So uh, I think um, Raul was asking about how do I get my angle back? Well, I take the X value and the Y value, right? As an example of my uh, unit vector, and I can get using a tan two, I can get the, the, uh, the resultant angle back. Okay. Um, so let's talk about kinematic seek and what seeking is. It's like I want to have an object chase another object. 
that's kinematic seek, right? And so really what it is, it takes as input the state, static data of both the autonomous character and the target. I want to go to the target is what it's saying, right? And it's going to calculate the direction. So I'm, again, I'm going to do that calculation we did earlier um, in, my, in our whiteboard, which is I want to take the, the target and I want to take the, you know, the initial location and I want to calculate the direction as an example. And uh, what I'm going to do, there's no smoothing here. I'm just going to turn around as much as, as fast as possible, right, as an example. And, um, and I'm going to do it over several frames and it's going to go to the target. And once it reaches the target, because I'm at max speed, I'm probably going to overshoot the target and come back. And it's going to keep on overshooting the target and coming back over and over again, just like this. Why? There's no deceleration, right? It's going to continue to overshoot the target and come back every single time. If there's any kind of look where you're going algorithm, so example, let's say I'm facing this way towards, uh, towards start, I'm facing in this direction, and then I want to face over in this direction, right? So then my, I might have a smoother motion that kind of looks like this, where I kind of do figure eights, right? And it's like I'm doing one of these, right? And as soon as I come out, I kind of go back. And because I'm moving at maximum speed, I don't move less than maximum, so I'm always doing this kind of thing, figure eights at the end of the day, right? And it's kind of a weird thing. When you first look at it, if your kinematic seek is pretty basic, that's what it should look like. It should just be figure eights. As soon as we get there, we're going to overshoot the target and come back and go back the other way. And we're never going to stop. It's never going to actually stop at the target. Why? Because we're continuously seeking the target. If I have a motion, let's go back to this. Let's suppose I have a speed of 10 pixels every frame. So the first frame, I move 10 pixels, 10 pixels, 10 pixels. As I march across the number line, right, um, or the, unit, the line segment, when I get to the end point, maybe I'm close to 10 pixels, I overshoot it. So I'm overshot by X number of pixels. Then I try and come back, but now I got to change my direction again because uh, when I'm, I'm looking where I'm going and I'm moving 10 pixels per frame. When I come, finally come to here, I kind of overshoot again and I go through it. And then I'm moving back again. I'm kind of turning around, whether it's this way or this way. And then I overshoot the target again. And I keep doing that over and over again. That's kinematic seek. Right, that we're going to see. There's no slowing down. It's just full, uh, full on velocity, uh, and so on. Okay, that's kinematic seek. Flee is the other way around, right? So remember our velocity, our our kind of uh, orientation to the target was the target minus the, um, you know, the the origin. We used this, uh, you know, kind of formula, which was n minus start. Well, flee is just the other way around, start minus end, which means I'm going to have my direction, my unit vector be completely opposite of this one, right? Why? I'm going to go in the opposite direction. So flee is wherever the, the, um, the enemy is. I wanna run, if I want to run away from an enemy, I calculate where the enemy is, the direction towards the enemy, and I literally run in the opposite direction. That's what flee is. It's the opposite of seek, all right? So kin kinematic flea is really just, you know, kind of a, the reverse of seek, okay? And there's also something called arrive. And what happens is there's ways of us slowing down. We can use a slow down. Again, there's no deceleration in kinematics. What we can do is rather linear interpolate from where the kind of the a position where we're going to start slowing down until we stop. So again, going back to this, Let's suppose at the end, if we're gonna from we're gonna go from start to end, but we have we're gonna use the arrive algorithm. So the arrive algorithm, it kind of uses a lot of times we use a radius, right? So let's say we have a radius from the end point, right? Let's use that radius. And let's suppose that the radius is some number of pixels, let's say around the end. And as we approach when we hit the radius, if I'm less than the distance from the radius to the to the end. I'm going to use linear interpolation to slow myself down from zero, oh, from 100% to zero. I'm going to go from 100% speed to zero in a very linear fashion. I'm going to slow down and stop right at the end. That's arrival, again. And it doesn't matter if I'm if I'm doing if I'm facing this direction. That's the worst case scenario. Facing away from the target. Let's suppose I kind of do an arc as I'm looking where I'm going. I have thrust behind me. Let's just suppose. And as I'm turning around, I kind of go towards the target. And as soon as I hit the radius, I slow down until I reach the target. That's arrival. Okay. And when I say slow down, it's, it's not deceleration. 
It's just a linear linear interpolation from 100% to zero. Okay. So that is a rival, right? So, so again, kinematic seek is like chasing. Kinematic flee is like running away. And arrival, we use a, a radius, and we kind of have a fixed time to target, which is our linear interpolation. How long is it going to take me from the radius to the target? And we're going to just stop when we get there, as an example. And we can use that smoothing. If you really don't want to use smoothing, it's just like you just stop it as soon as we get to the target, right? Starting at the radius, we start calculating what the what the time is to radius from the from the edge of the radius to the target, and we can just stop immediately on a dime. It look it'll look very unnatural, but it can be done. Um, there's also something else we can use. There's also something called a kinematic wander. And usually a lot of times uh, we use this for uh, things like enemies uh, that are um, are doing things like, like um, patrolling in an area or they're walking around a field. They have a general goal or direction um, as an example, but uh, they have a randomized direction. They're kind of meandering or wandering around. And the way to do that is that you continuously change your orientation uh, over a number of frames. Okay, so the way the re, the way we use is we use something called a random binomial, and uh, we use we generate a number between negative one and one, where negative one is a rotation to the left and one is a rotation to the right, and we do this every x number of frames so that it looks like we're wandering. If we do it every single frame, if we change the direction every frame, it'll be a lot of jitter. There'll be a lot of jittering around, uh, which won't look really natural. So we do it. Uh, we have a delay. Usually we have a frame delay of of a random number of frames that we wait, all right? So that way it's not so jittery, okay? And that is um, kinematic wandering. Okay, we're gonna be talking about that in a bit as well, right? And um, and really that is the topic of, of what we've talked about today. So we've talked about just a review. We've talked about motion. How do we move things around our uh, autonomous agents? We've talked about the difference between, um, you know, uh, movement, or locomotion animation. We've discussed a couple of things, and in our lab on on Thursday, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get you guys to use the engine to move objects around the screen, and we're also gonna get you more familiar with um, you know, how the engine works. One of the challenges that you're gonna have for the engine, this is kind of our high-level lab two goal. Alex is gonna come up with uh, more specific requirements for, for lab two before Thursday. But really what it's going to be is you're going to somehow figure out how to add in your own Starship game object on your own. How do I do that? How do I add a game object? And so if you want to get ready for this, because one of the challenges for, for Thursday is how to do that, is um, I, I invite you to take a look at the framework and see how objects are added in right now. See if you can do it on your own. And I think you'll have a much better time on Thursday instead of you know us waiting for you to do it in day, for you to do it now. So start thinking about take an object and I want to be able to add a brand new game object from scratch. How do I do that? Try it now for yourselves. Uh, you know, not now, I mean, like at this particular moment, but before we see you on on, uh, on the lab on, on Thursday. And I think you'll have more success. You'll get more out of the lab if you try it on your own, okay? Yes, yeah, you don't have to use a sprite sheet. Um, you can use a single sprite. So take a look. There are some examples there that do not use sprites at all. Okay, so think about how do I add an object, um, you know, without using a sprite sheet. Okay. Um, and there are, if you look at the start screen, start scene, um, we have a kind of a ship, and that ship that's in the start scene, uh, it doesn't have any uh, any sprite sheet related to it whatsoever. Okay. Any other questions before we go for the day? So really what we wanted to cover today was at a very high level, I know we're ending a lot earlier today, like I told you, but at a very high level is this idea of, um, you know, steering behaviors and kinematic movement, right? Seek, flee, arrive, and wander, and what that kind of looks like for us, right? I've also given you a couple of references. One reference is on, um, on Blackboard right now, and it talks about um, the kind of the algorithm, which is the... Um, uh, the seek algorithm, and we're going to be working on the seek algorithm first, and we're going to be refining it over two classes, right? Because lab one is, notice the start of lab two starts here, and then uh, lab two finishes here. So uh, again, one thing to notice is our lab, which is normally due on Sunday, there's two parts to it, part one and part two, 
So the second part is we're going to finish Seek and we're going to implement something called Look Where You're Going, which is a new algorithm we're going to learn about next week. Okay? Questions before we go for the day. Actually, I'm going to start rec stop recording and I'm going to hope I'm going to I'm going to try and help you guys uh, with things like what Lucas is asking for. Did I get your repo? Um, you know, do you have groups and all that kind of stuff? So I'm going to stop recording here and then help people with uh, some administrative issues in our course. OK, so I'm going to stop recording on YouTube now. Thank you.